Hello, welcome to the next unit in history of the English language. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to talk about how historical linguistics developed and how the, uh, uh, the development of this, this discipline was tied to the discovery of an ancestor language to many of the languages spoken in Europe and Western and Southern Asia today, and that is Proto-Indo-European, and all of these languages are grouped together under the Indo-European language family to which English itself belongs. The picture on this first slide here depicts uh, the steppes, S-T-E-P-P-E-S, of Kazakhstan, where uh, in very recently, in fact, the um, archaeologist Gennady Zidanovich uh, discovered Bronze Age spiral cities for, built around 2000, which show signs of having been built by the Indo-Europeans. But Let's go back in time. Let's go back to before we knew about Indo-European, before we had this idea of how languages changed over time. Let's go back to the prehistory of historical linguistics. Just as chemistry has a prehistory of historical, uh, sorry, just chemistry has a prehistory in alchemy, and physics has a has a prehistory in, in magic and and medicine in bad medicine. Um, so historical linguistics has its own sort of pre-scientific uh, kind of life. So let's talk about that very briefly. Now, of course, in Europe, as far as Europe was concerned, the original language, the source of all languages, was the so-called Adamic language, the language of Adam. And this was, it was believed, the language that was spoken by all human beings, it's in one language, until uh, in Genesis, I forget which chapter, um, that language gets confused at Babel. This is how God punishes humans for their overweening pride, uh, Nimrod the mighty hunter and all that, and um, disperses all of the peoples into different language groups. Um, and this is the, uh, the, the origin story. Here, seen here as a painting by Peter Breuthel, uh, the elder, of the Tower of, ba of Babel. Um, sorry, the, so, um, in the 17th century, there were efforts to re, to recover what the Adamic language was, and it was believed to be either, some people believed it to be Hebrew, or to be closely resembling Hebrew, and there were attempts to sort of trace connections between all the other languages and Hebrew. Um, according to Isidore of Seville, the, um, the Spanish bishop and scholar from around 600, uh, in the common era, there are 72 languages, as he pronounced this in, with, with uh, full authority, there are 72 languages on earth, 15 for Japheth, 30 for Ham, and 27 for Shem. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that these are the three sons of Noah. And so, of course, if, if Noah's family was all that was left of mankind, then uh, his three sons were the um, considered to be the founder, and they were uh, of three different groups of people. And and for um, much of pre-modern Europe, these were associated with the three continents that were known. So J this Japheth went to Europe, um, and, the, and the, all the European peoples were descendants of Japheth. Ham went to Africa, and all the um, Africans were the descendants of Ham, and Shem went to Asia, and all of um, the, the, the Western Asians, they don't really know about the Chinese or the uh, Indians or anything, were the descendants of Shem. And this is where actually we get Semite and Semitic from, is from this Shem, because it was believed that the, the European languages were the Japhetic languages, the African languages, including Egyptian and others, were Hamitic. And of course, this Bible story always also... Um, uh, justified all kinds of horrible nonsense because because Ham is cursed in the Bible and so this was considered a justification for enslaving the descendants of Ham. Cute, eh? Um, anyway, uh, so this is Isidore Seville's theory. Um, Dante, uh, writing in the thirteen no the late twelve yeah around to uh, around around thirteen hundred, um, in addition to to his Italian poetry, also wrote treatises in Latin, including one on. Uh, the importance and the beauty of the Italian language. This is called De Vulgari Eloquentia. And Dante comes up with the remar a remarkable theory of language change that, um, and we now know this is precisely backwards, but he believed that the vernacular, that is Italian or Spanish or French, 
must have come before Latin, because how could, because he saw Latin grammar, and for reasons we'll see why uh, in the next video, uh, he saw Latin grammar as more complex, and the language is more complex than the vernacular, and how he reasoned could simpler things come out of more complicated things. This isn't how things work. More complicated things come out of simple things. Nobody could actually just learn Latin as their native language and mother tongue. Therefore, Italian or some other vernacular must have come before Latin. So this is Dante's sort of theory of language change. Um, John Dee is an interesting character. He was... Um, uh, he believed that the languages were descended, that the Adamic language was an occult angelic language. Occult in the sense of hidden or secret. This is from a Latin word, occultus, meaning, meaning conce the cool is, is related to conceal. Um, and so John Dee, John Dee investigated using Hebrew and other, uh, mysterious magical manuscripts what the angelic language was. So he, he made a lot of observations about the nature of language and grammar that were systematic in general in the way that modern linguistics would be. In the 17th century, this became a huge topic of discussion. Um, the Adamic language was frequently discussed. This was, of course, a time when they were trying to combine the new scientific, rationalistic, mathematical methods developed by Francis Bacon and Galileo and Copernicus with the authority of biblical scripture. And it was in this century that, of course, Bishop Usher of Dublin um, worked out precisely the date of creation uh, based on a combination of astronomical calculations uh, correlated with um, a very careful reading of the Bible. It was not, uh, his, his dating was not an attempt to refute scientific authority, but to use it to better understand the Bible. Um, and of course, some young earth creationists have, have stuck to that date. Um, and of course, there was the frequent uh, interest in Hebrew and the theory that Hebrew, which was the language of the Old Testament, was the original language in the Adamic language. But two important um, thinkers, Enlightenment thinkers, scientific thinkers of the period, uh, Robert Boyle, one of the founders of the Scientific Royal Society, and, and you might know him if you've ever taken a chemistry class, is the formulator of Boyle's Law, and John Locke, the famous uh, um, a, a philosopher and political theorist, they're skeptical about the idea that Hebrew, they just don't see it. Um, and so this is this sort of state of the, um, the question, when our hero comes onto the scene, um, I know hero worship is a little passe, but William Jones is pretty awesome. Uh, he's the Isaac Newton of historical linguistics. Uh, Sir William Jones, uh, or Yunz Uxfardi, as he was known, in in in, uh, in Persia, that this is his Persian name, uh, which is a, a repronunciation of Jones of Oxford, um, and he he really belongs to this period of the Enlightenment, and he's the discoverer of the Indo-European language family and the common descent of a great number of languages, and worked out a number of these sort of methods and concepts that were then used to. Uh, put the investigation of language change and language history on a firmer footing. So who was William Jones? He was a lawyer and a scholar. He had um, intended to study Greek and Latin and the humanities at university, but he wasn't rich enough to support himself, which you had to be at the time, kind of still do. Um, but uh, anyway, he, um, so he went to law, law school so that he could, um, he could uh, support him, him and family, but he um, continued to be a scholar he was also a radical thinker and, and somebody who was really kind of uh, keen on the Enlightenment ideas at the, at the time and Lockean ideas about liberty and equality, and therefore he was perhaps a friend of American independence. There were actually people over in England who were arguing on the side of the American revolutionaries, um, in, uh, including the um, the famous uh, founder of, of, considered founder of sort of political conservatism, Edmund Burke, also argued the case for American independence. Um, in any case, maybe maybe he was his ideas weren't well received, but he ended up finding himself in India, um, which is at the very beginning of what would become the Raj, the British rule in India. In 1783, he's appointed a judge at Fort William in Calcutta, Bengal. Calcutta was the seat of the British Empire at the time, and he became very interested in the um, Sanskrit language. Now, one of the reasons he became so interested in Sanskrit, Sanskrit was the ancient, sacred language of India. 
and a lot of their ancient law codes were written in Sanskrit. And the um, British were very keen on, um, as in the way they, they ran their empire at the time, especially not really stepping on people's toes in terms of local custom, but just sort of like, putting themselves in place of the local ruler and saying, you know, carry on with your own laws and your own customs. We'll just be at the top collecting the tax money and the trade goods. Um, and so he, uh, they set up a court system and people would bring uh, cases. And as a judge, he would have to hear these cases. And the Indian lawyers would come and argue based on Indian legal texts. And um, often the, these cases were determined or argued based on a kind of like way of interpreting these ancient Sanskrit legal texts uh, and he decided that he really needed, in order to know whether somebody was, you know, trying to pull the wool over his eyes, better learn some Sanskrit. So there's somebody who already knew Greek, Latin, Persian, um, French, German, uh, and and several other languages. He decided that he would, he found um, that Sanskrit was an interesting challenge and also had some very interesting features to it. And his studies of Sanskrit resulted in his key discovery. In 1786, he writes a proposal that Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin had a common root, which was kind of a mind-blowing thing at the time. And we're going to talk about this a little bit more in the next video because I've been told that people don't watch videos if they're too long. So uh, tune into part two of William Jones. Uh, the, the original Indiana Jones uh, the, and the discovery of the Indo-European language family.